All right, everybody, uh, welcome uh, to uh, yet another Weather West uh, live office hour session here on YouTube. And, you know, this is one of the uh, multiple sessions I'm having this week. Just as a reminder, I had one a couple days ago. Uh, obviously, if you're joining me now, you, you figured out when this one was. Uh, I'm also planning to have another one this weekend at 10 a.m. Pacific time to discuss uh, the same thing we're going to be talking about today, which is the uh, the major storm slated for later Sunday uh, into Monday uh, and maybe Tuesday across portions of California. And I think that I'm going to keep that one uh, right around 10 a.m. Sunday because there still is some considerable uncertainty uh, regarding exactly how this is going to unfold, uh, as I'll talk about in the next few minutes. Uh, I know that there are a lot of folks uh, joining today who are either uh, concerned about the storm or who are journalists, and I will spend more time than usual going through the live comments to answer and address those questions. As usual, I will probably do that toward the end of the session. Uh, as always, these are recorded and are generally available in raw form immediately after the broadcast ends and with a very slightly edited uh, usually with a few links added uh, some hours after. It takes a little while for YouTube to render that version, but generally speaking, if you have to step off or you can't join for the whole thing, I will answer the questions in the chat, and the answers will be uh, available and recorded after the fact as well as live. So today's topic is, the, of course, the big storm that's coming. Uh, that's going to affect m much of California, probably from about the San Francisco Bay Area or the Interstate 80 corridor southward, uh, all the way uh, toward Los Angeles and southward even further toward uh, the Mexican border. And south of that as well, Baja California is going to see some very heavy rainfall potentially out of this as well. But the focus of this system increasingly has been part of the question about how this is going to unfold and right now it looks like the hardest hit part of the state may end up somewhere between about uh, Monterey and Los Angeles. That's a big section of the state. It includes the entire central coast and there is still a little bit of a margin uh, both to the north including much of the San Francisco Bay Area uh, on, on that end and then uh, all the way down into Orange and San Diego counties south of that. Now, everybody in California is likely to see some precipitation from the system, but I'm really honing in on that central coast region, uh, sort of the, the northern part of southern California, or the southern part of northern California, if you will, depending on where you draw your lines, uh, as being the places that are most likely to get the highest uh, rainfall and the strongest winds from the storm. And the situation has changed a little bit from yesterday. There were some uh, quite alarming uh, rain projections coming out of the ensembles yesterday for portions of the Central Coast, really from Santa Barbara into Los Angeles County. Uh, those have come down from the stratosphere a little bit today as the path and the, the degree to which the storm will stall comes into slightly better focus. Uh, we're still expecting a very uh, significant event with the potential for widespread and potentially serious flooding in portions of Southern California. Uh, but there is a little bit of good news in that some of the very worst, wettest outcomes now today appear a little bit less likely than they did yesterday, which is one of the reasons why, by the way, it is important to be really careful with the messaging that we use uh, as scientists and meteorologists talking about these things because there's always a wide range of potential outcomes, and in some cases, you know, the models or the ensembles will spit out something that is really uh, eyeball popping and genuinely alarming were it to occur. But what happens, uh, and some of these members in the broader model predictive ensemble world uh, do not make a reality necessarily. So sometimes what the ensemble will tell us is that this is the kind of pattern that if it comes to fruition in the, the worst possible way and the worst possible sequencing uh, foreseeable, that it could be really bad. But that there's a number of ways, there's a number of uh, off-ramps and off uh, sort of uh, relief valves, if you will, for that pattern to produce a somewhat less extreme outcome than the very most extreme model numbers. And I think that may be where we're headed with this event. Now, I don't want to downplay it because it still looks like uh, this is going to be quite a major storm for Southern California and the Central Coast region with potentially very high impacts and widespread significant flooding and some wind damage. So I'll get into that in a moment. And also highlighting that 
Uh, just because the ensemble swung into a slightly less extreme uh, outcome today, it does not mean, because the system is still a few days out, Sunday or Monday is going to be the peak of this storm, that they could not swing back closer to where they were yesterday in the next model update cycle or so. Uh, and I'll discuss a little bit why there is so much uncertainty in this context. It turns out that this is not necessarily a, a, a matter of the models being uh, out to lunch or, or too variable. This is probably a situation, in fact, where the meteorological outcome should be extremely sensitive to small differences in the initial conditions and small, relatively subtle differences in the evolution of the pattern. So we'll talk about all of that in a moment. But I do want to briefly summarize what just happened uh, over California with the last system, which was no slouch. That was a very significant rain event in some places. Uh, there, there was some significant thunderstorm activity as well, as has been, has, has been the case this season with essentially every uh, major uh, system we've seen. Cutoff lows, atmospheric rivers, uh, cold frontal passages, they've all been associated with an unusual amount of lightning and convective activity over California all the way since October. And I don't see any reason why that won't continue with this next system Sunday and Monday. In fact, I think that in some ways the models ha have been underdoing uh, the convective potential to a, a certain degree with some of these systems. And even then, they are suggesting that with this next storm, there could yet be more thunderstorms with locally torrential downpours. Um, Part of this, I think, uh, and part of the reason why the models may be slightly underestimating these sorts of events this year is related to how warm the nearshore ocean temperatures are. Uh, a couple of folks have pointed out online that technically, according to the NOAA def definition of a marine heat wave, much of the ocean between California and Hawaii is experiencing a significant marine heat wave and has been for months. In fact, it is of, of, of moderate severity meaning that the ocean temperatures are anywhere from about 3 to 5 Fahrenheit warmer than average across a very broad region. And just to be clear, it is much more difficult to raise the temperature of the ocean by 1 degree Fahrenheit than it is to raise the atmosphere uh, by 1 degree Fahrenheit because of the high heat capacity of water. And so it means a lot when ocean temperatures are 3 to 5 degrees uh, Fahrenheit above average across such a broad region. And what it means is really two things. The most obvious and direct thing is that the warmer the surface ocean is, the more potential evaporation there is off of it. And in general, the more moisture there is in the lower atmosphere. Uh, we know that with rising temperatures, rates of evaporation, given an unlimited amount of water and energy, uh, go up quite rapidly. And there isn't necessarily an unlimited amount of energy over oceans, but functionally, you know, it's a surface of water, so there is an unlimited amount of water. Uh, so you're not water limited, you're just energy limited. So essentially the atmosphere is going to evaporate as much water as it can, uh, given energetic constraints, because over open bodies of water, there's, you're, you're not going to dry out the surface. There's, there's just that more and more water coming from underneath. So what that means in practice, is as ocean temperatures warm uh, and as atmospheric temperatures warm, those rates of evaporation of water vapor into the lower atmosphere are going to increase quite quickly. So a few degrees of warming of nearshore and offshore water temperatures means that there's more moisture in that lower atmosphere. And because there's more moisture, it also tends to be a little bit warmer uh, because you have the, the lowest levels of the atmosphere over broad bodies of water like the Pacific Ocean tend to essentially be the same as the surface water temperature, at least in the lowest layer of the atmosphere. So they kind of equilibrate and approach each other, meaning that the lower atmosphere itself, the air, is also a few degrees warmer than usual, and it's persistently so. So even when we get these colder air masses uh, blowing over the surface ocean, that narrow layer in the boundary layer near the surface of the water is still going to be warmer and moister than usual, even as the air aloft might be colder as systems approach. And that leads to uh, increases in atmospheric instability. So all of this, I think, is partly why we've seen so many thunderstorms with systems uh, this year in California, why we will continue to see some of these really intense hourly downpours that are not always foreseeable uh, using these predictive uh, global predictive models that have very coarse horizontal resolution that can't resolve these individual thunder cells. Uh, and I think it, it really tells us maybe something about what uh, California's future winters may look increasingly like in a warming climate. Maybe that's a 
conversation for another day, given everything else going on right now. But I do think, you know, the reason why the ocean is really warm right now near the coast of California and broadly offshore, there is a little bit of an El Nino influence. You know, when we do get the strong El Nino events, you know, talking with coastal oceanographers, we sometimes see what are called coastally trapped Kelvin waves, uh, which is a fancy way of saying that things happening in the uh, in the equatorial Pacific can indirectly uh, it, it sort of inhibit the nearshore upwelling that usually brings cool temperatures to the California coast. So that is part of the reason why we're seeing such warm conditions. But the rest of the reason is global warming and the fact that the oceans are getting warmer. So it's a combination of El Nino and global warming as to why the oceans are so warm over such a broad region. Not 100% clear exactly the extent to which each is a relevant player, but they're both significant. The long-term trend, of course, is mainly because of climate change and the warming of the oceans associated with that. So I just wanted to highlight this as a reason why a number of places in California have seen very intense thunderstorm downpours that have caused significant flash flooding uh, somewhat unexpectedly during uh, storm events that were supposed to be, you know, significant storms, but were not necessarily... Uh, uh, predicted to have extremely high hourly rainfall rates in individual areas. Now, granted, sometimes we can't pinpoint those in advance anyway, but I think this is part of the reason why it's happening and why uh, reliance on these global models, which is usually good enough in California for a lot of purposes, might not quite cut it when it comes to these localized torrential downpours, which we've now seen in December in Ventura County, where three inches of rain fell in an hour and caused widespread flash flooding overnight during a thunderstorm in Ventura. Uh, just last week in San Diego, as I've discussed before, where another similar situation, very unstable uh, local uh, spin in the atmosphere, contributed by unusually unstable uh, air uh, with warm ocean water nearby and the favorable po favorable positioning of a jet streak overhead. The curvature allowed that upward motion to occur and accentuate, take advantage uh, of that moist and unstable air. And then to a slightly lesser degree, it just happened in San Francisco uh, just yesterday during the, the, the storm frontal passage where parts of downtown saw over an inch of rain in an hour once again. And there was significant urban flooding for the second time in two years in the city itself of San Francisco. So now we've seen at least three examples of this, and actually, as folks are pointing out in the comments, this also happened again during the previous system in Long Beach, where a flash flood warning was issued for major urban and flash flooding. So we've now seen this happen at least four times this year in California, in San Francisco, Ventura, um, Long Beach, and San Diego under, under similar conditions but at different times. And I would be, I would actually expect this to happen somewhere again between about San Francisco and San Diego uh, during this upcoming storm event. Uh, it's difficult to pinpoint exactly where, but it is a concern given that soils are now highly saturated from the Bay Area South all the way to central Baja, California. And so if this happens somewhere, that is where there is likely to be immediate and potentially serious flooding during this upcoming event. So I just wanted to highlight those warm ocean temperatures as, as being really important, and there being both an El Nino and a climate change story there. Uh, but also, usually I don't do this, but I did want to address this first question uh, from the producers at CBS News, uh, just to make sure I don't forget it, and so that they get the answer before they have to leave, because I know they're leaving in person to do some coverage down in Southern California in advance of what's going to happen. Uh, the, their question is, in light of the recent storms that have hit Southern California uh, in just the past couple of months, what should places like Seal Beach or Long Beach or other areas expect uh, in the coming years as we continue to experience climate change? Uh, and I've uh, hinted at a little a piece of that, but I don't think that's the whole story so far. Uh, and I think I'll generalize the answer to coastal Southern California because I don't think there's big differences necessarily from place to place along the Southern California coast. The answer is similar. Uh, and really, the answer is similar throughout much of California, which is that, you know, in a warming climate in California specifically, what we expect to see are, of course, warmer temperatures. And we think about that often in terms of uh, more intense summer heat waves, which we are seeing. But where that actually makes maybe even more of a difference sometimes is in the cool season in winter, because it means that the atmosphere has a more capacity to hold water vapor. In fact, that uh, I, I use the analogy of, of the expanding atmospheric sponge, 
uh, because it works in both directions. Much as a kitchen sponge uh, can soak up more water if it's larger and there's water available, the same thing is true in reverse. A larger kitchen sponge, if you squeeze it out and there's a lot of water in it, can produce more water uh, if it's larger than it used to be. So if the expanding atmospheric sponge is the metaphor, uh, the, 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 the resultant uh, physical behavior in the real world is that we see uh, increasingly intense precipitation extremes on the one hand uh, and increasingly intense evaporative extremes on the other hand. So the, uh, the ceiling on how uh, intense both precipitation can become on the one hand and evaporation can become on the other both increase quickly with even just a couple of degrees of warming. In fact, this is an exponential process. Uh, this, th these increases are around the rate of 7% per degree centigrade or 3 or 4% per degree Fahrenheit uh, increase uh, uh, of warming. And that is not a small number because globally we've already seen around 1.3, 1.4 centigrade of warming. Most land areas, including California, have warmed about 50% faster than that global average. Uh, so the, the, those numbers locally are even higher. What it means in practice is that, uh, you know, even though there aren't a great deal of studies looking specifically at California precipitation extremes to date uh, and what the global warming contribution is at this point, my null hy hypothesis, my, my default assumption at this point is that most extreme precipitation events that occur today in California are about 10 to 15 percent more intense uh, than they would have been in the 20th century without global warming because of this increasing atmospheric sponge effect and the fact that we've already warmed globally uh, 1.3, 1.4 centigrade and locally more than that. Uh, so, you know, 10% uh, increase in the intensity of extreme precipitation events is kind of my floor. Uh, and that number, of course, is going to rise with additional warming. And uh, with specific events, it probably varies. Maybe some events it's only 5%, other events it's maybe closer to 15 or 20% more intense due to the global warming we've already observed, but I think that, that sort of that 10% number is a good default hypothesis these days. And again, that number isn't static, it's going to continue to rise over time. So what it means is that the extreme events we're seeing, extreme precipitation events both in Southern California and generally throughout the state, at this point are in, 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 in all likelihood tangibly more extreme than they would have been 50 or 100 years ago had we not experienced the warming. And the same thing is true of drought severity and of wildfires for uh, due to the, the, the other side of the expanding atmospheric sponge, the increasing potential intensity of evaporation, which extracts more and more water from the landscape faster and faster, and it dries out vegetation faster. But all of this is a good lesson because it suggests that even in the absence of a large trend in California's average annual precipitation, that we could still see big increases in the kind of events that actually matter from a practical perspective. So you could imagine a future where California is significantly warmer, uh, with more intense heat waves in the summer, uh, less snow in the mountains, higher average snow lines as those temperatures push those snow lines further and further up in elevation, with relatively little change in average annual precipitation, but large increases in both flood and drought risk, uh, as well as wildfire risk because of this increase in what I call hydroclimate whiplash due to this expanding atmospheric sponge effect. So the other piece that's important right along the coast, of course, is sea level rise. And, and along the California coast, sea level has already risen between about 6 and 12 inches due to global warming. It depends a little bit on where you are because in some cases, geologically, the land surface is sinking or rising, which can either uh, dampen or accentuate the global warming effect. Uh, there is likely to be a, a considerable amount of additional sea level rise regardless of the warming trajectory that we go on. So I think it's safe to count on at least a couple more feet of sea level rise this century, which is, you know, that puts us in the, the three foot of rise territory in many places, uh, you know, over, over a century or so, which is quite significant. But what we're already starting to see with just six to 12 inches of sea level rise is we're seeing that the effects of the king tides are greater, you know, these king tides, they always would result in occasional coastal flooding, especially when they coincided with winter storms. But now, you know, those king tides are six to 12 inches higher and those storm surges associated with these powerful Pacific storms, as we've seen several times this year and may see again this week, in some cases are a foot higher. 
And, you know, that extra foot matters a lot in some cases uh, in terms of how much coastal inundation there is. In fact, in some cases, it's nonlinear, of course, because the coastal plain is sloped uh, and waves uh, are not always uh, enti- linear uh, f- phenomena. So uh, I won't get into the details here, but that sea level rise that we've already seen is making it easier and easier to see this coastal flooding. Uh, that's especially pronounced either during a natural high tides like, like king tides or during storm events, and especially when all three of these things coincide, king tides, a big winter storm, and sea level rise associated with global warming. And this is going to be an increasing challenge in coastal areas. I mean, we've seen pretty significant damage and injuries from large battering waves and coastal storm surges and flooding this winter and last winter in both northern and southern California. So this is a taste of the future, and that is likely to become an even greater challenge moving forward. We're going to notice it the most during El Nino years, when the sea level is a few inches higher on top of that. We're going to notice it most during storm events and during king tide events, as we've seen this year. All right, so I will come back to the questions. I just wanted to answer that one to begin with, but I I, I want to jump into the storm situation first. Uh, I know there's a lot of folks uh, waiting online, so uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to jump uh, and look at some weather data right now. So I'm going to take a quick sip of water, and then you're going to see the screen switch over to some charts. Uh, so just give me a moment here. You may see a brief ad while I take a sip of water, just to give my voice a brief break. So don't go anywhere. I'll be back in less than 30 seconds. everybody welcome back just want to make sure that I've got um, what I wanted to show on screen looks like that's showing up nicely uh, so you those of you who have been watching my office hours over the past week uh, are familiar with this chart but what it's showing in this case are all of the 51 different ensemble members from the latest European model the uh, predictive weather model the ECMWF and it's indicating what each of those individual members is projecting for accumulated precipitation at a point near Los Angeles Airport, uh, which is sort of randomly chosen to be representative of the Southern California coastal plain uh, over the next a couple of weeks. And in this case, really what's of interest is what is what's going to occur between about Sunday and Tuesday or Wednesday next week. So we can kind of ignore the next uh, 48 hours for the most part, just some isolated showers. And after that, it looks like things will calm down too. So we're mainly looking at this uh, Sunday through Tuesday-ish period. And what I really want to highlight here, and I'll I'll mention this with the mouse, uh, down here at the bottom, this is the ensemble average. Uh, meaning that this is the projected cumulative precipitation. And again, most of this is falling between uh, about Sunday morning and uh, Monday morning. So just over a few days, or really even between uh, sun- uh, Sunday afternoon and Tuesday morning. So maybe, maybe an even shorter period. And in previous uh, cycles, these numbers have gotten as high as, I'm going backwards in time. This is what last uh, yesterday's evenings were showing. Um, and part of this is because of the precipitation that had yet to occur. Uh, and so there's a little bit here from yesterday's system still baked into this. So that's part of the reason why the number has come down a bit. Uh, but look at, you know, even, even uh, uh, yesterday's uh, for the middle of the day, you know, for Los Angeles, the ensemble average is showing, was suggesting close to nine inches of rain. But what I'm really wanting to highlight here is that just as recently as uh, 18 hours ago, this European ensemble had a lot of members where there was well over 10 inches of rain. I mean, look at this one. This is almost 15 inches. This is almost 16 inches. Another 14, 12, 12, 14 inches, 13, 11 inches. Again, this is for LA, and most of this would have fallen over about a 48-hour period. Those were fairly alarming numbers. But notice also that there were numbers that were a little bit, I mean, still very heavy for Los Angeles, but much less into the stratosphere. Numbers like 5 and 4.5, but those were in the minority. But look what happened with the most recent update cycle. 
these numbers are a lot lower. And although the ensemble average is still around six inches, which is, for, which is quite high for LA, we got rid of a lot of the numbers that were in the stratosphere. So right now, uh, across, looking across the full European model ensemble, I'm not really seeing very many members over 10. Uh, and in fact, I'm seeing a lot more members in the three to six inch range, which again is still a very heavy rain event for Los Angeles proper, considering this is a part of the world that only sees 10 to 15 inches of rain in a typical year. So this is still suggesting that LA could see somewhere you know, a third to half of the uh, average annual precipitation from this single storm coming up. Uh, but it's a little bit less uh, concerning than some of the runs we saw yesterday. So I want to dig into why this is. I don't want to reassure folks too much because even this is still going to result in a lot of urban and, and creek flooding and potentially some serious flash flooding. And I also don't want to overly reassure folks because you know, when a model does this, when it, when it suddenly, when the whole ensemble shifts downward significantly from one update cycle to the next, it suggests that one of these cycles is probably what we call under dispersed. So there's not a sufficiently wide range of outcomes. Either the earlier wetter cycle was not showing a high enough probability of less extreme outcomes, or the more recent cycle is not showing a high enough probability of more extreme outcomes. So meaning that I don't think we can rule out still the kind of events we saw in the last update cycle, even though I think that something closer to what we're seeing right now is more realistic and more likely at this point. Um, this still represents a major flood threat for Southern California, as I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a moment. But I do think uh, it's important to keep in mind that the very most extreme model cycles and model members are not the most likely ones to come to fruition. It just tells us sort of what the upper end of the envelope of possibilities might be. Uh, and I still think this is potentially, this is quite likely to result in significant to even major flooding in Southern California, but I think this sort of reduces the, the upper end of the envelope where there were some pretty extreme outcomes that were looking like they were at least possible yesterday, and that's a little bit less likely today. All right, let's look at why this might be. And here I'm looking at a different model that's even more up to date. This is the American model, the, the GFS. Uh, but what I'm showing right now uh, is I'm going to step forward in time. This is this is sort of for right now, this morning, showing some uh, rain showers at lower elevations with some embedded isolated thunderstorms and then some mountain snow showers, but generally quieter conditions than yesterday. No widespread rain or frontal systems. Um, there actually could be some decent shower and thunderstorm activity in the Central Valley in the Bay Area later this evening. This is what this is showing with some heavier mountain snow showers, probably not continuous, but they could pile up given that the air mass is finally cold enough to do so down to lake level. Um, and so decent snow actually possible today and overnight. Saturday looks quieter though, especially in the morning. And you can see that most of California with the exception of maybe just an isolated shower or two looks dry just about everywhere. Uh, but then look what happens later. So this is uh, Saturday afternoon into evening look as this system starts to take shape. So this is a system that is one of those ones that is quote unquote blowing up out of the ether. So this is not a system that was present uh, really Saturday morning. This is just sort of a blob of, of, uh, of, of, of really baroclinic, uh, really a baroclinic leaf you might even call it, the very early stages of the storm uh, development. But there isn't a big storm to the west of here uh, that's necessarily blowing up and, and, and moving into California. This is something that's going to rapidly develop in this region, just uh, off the coast of Central and Southern California. And that's one of the reasons why this is so tricky, because this is not a storm that's moving from A to B, and we just need to be able to plot the trajectory. But this is one that is developing rapidly in place. And this is often a difficult thing for the models to get right and to pinpoint both the degree to which it strengthens, exactly when it's going to do so, and how much it strengthens. And all of those things make a big difference in terms of how extreme the flood threat is in Southern California, and also how significant the wind threat is further north along the Central Coast and into the Bay Area, and possibly into the Sacramento Valley as well. So I've highlighted this week that there really are two potential concerns. One is for uh, fairly serious uh, flash flood risk in this region from Santa Barbara, uh, county eastward into LA and Orange counties, and then a pretty significant wind threat 
uh, further north from about Santa Barbara north into uh, uh, San Mateo County or so up along the central coast. And that those different extremes are somewhat at odds of each other. The more extreme the wind event, it means that the low deepened uh, more intensively further north, and that might keep some of the more extreme precipitation from streaming into Southern California for as long. But if the low deepens further south or actually is a little bit less intense, that means that the likelihood of a prolonged subtropical atmospheric river producing severe flooding in Southern California goes up. We still don't know today exactly which of these solutions is going to be more weighted towards reality, but here is what the, uh, the, the American model is showing right now. With deepening, again, of the surface low right off the coast, this is now Saturday evening where it starts to rain along the central coast into the Bay Area. Overnight Saturday, it gets real windy along the central coast in the Bay Area. The storm continues to strengthen. 987 is a pretty low low, although it's not as low as some earlier solutions that were suggesting a 975 millibar low in the same place. So this would be a significant wind and rain event for the Bay Area and the central coast. As you can see, um, this is Sunday morning. Uh, this, this, this would be a very stormy Sunday morning for the San Francisco Bay Area and the central coast with powerful winds probably some lightning embedded in torrential rain bands. So this is a significant storm scenario for the Bay Area. You can also see that snow levels are much lower in the Sierra Nevada than have been the case in recent storms. So this is likely to be a heavy snowstorm down to lake level, finally, for the first time in a while. You can see it's Sunday morning, and uh, except for Santa Barbara, there's really not much going on in Southern California yet. So it's windy and rainy in Santa Barbara, not extreme yet, but the rain is picking up. Uh, but the system is making its sweet time in this most recent uh, American model iteration before the rain really starts to pick up now. So now this is a heavy rain event for Santa Barbara, Ventura, and starting to be in western Los Angeles County too. This is by late Sunday afternoon, early evening Sunday, where the Bay Area is continuing to get high winds and occasional bands of showers and heavy thunderstorms uh, extending north. The Sierra Nevada is still getting hammered with very heavy snowfall. And probably some and probably some wind. Um, the place in California where I don't think this is going to be a huge storm. This does not look like a huge storm for the North Coast or far northern far northern California by Mount Shasta, the North Valley. It's still going to rain. It's still going to be breezy, and there's going to be some lower elevation snow. But it doesn't look like an enormous storm uh, up that far north. At this point, the storm starts to fill and weaken, and Northern California still get scattered showers and isolated thunderstorms with some gusty winds but things start to taper off. This is by uh, the overnight hours Sunday into early Monday morning. But then look down in Southern California where this rain band, this subtropical moisture plume is kind of stalled out, uh, now uh, moving just inching eastward over LA County. So this is when Los Angeles and LA County would see the heavier rain and it moves slowly off, weakening slightly as it goes towards Orange, San Diego counties. Um, where there's some secondary filling in of this rain band, though. Uh, now this is now um, uh, throughout Monday. This fills back in uh, across Southern California as the secondary frontal wave and some additional moisture comes in, uh, leading to, again, some renewed heavy rainfall further south across Orange and San Diego counties and down into northern Baja. So it looks like it may rain continuously uh, in L.A. County from around late Sunday afternoon, potentially uh, all the way through, let's see, let's count this. Uh, this would be uh, really not until Wednesday morning. So late Sunday afternoon to Wednesday morning, it ra may be raining the entire time in much of Southern California. It may not be extremely intense the whole time, but it will be a pretty long duration rain event. Now it is worth noting that the this uh, American model, the GFS, these rain totals are, are quite heavy in Southern California, but they're not as extreme as what the, the European model ensemble had suggested yesterday. Uh, which I think is good news because at this point, what some of the some of the wetter members yesterday in the European ensemble were suggesting would have been a very serious flood situation for all of Southern California. This suggests that the flood situation will still be widespread, but a little less severe, and and, and the more serious flooding might be more isolated. So, still a major flood threat, but maybe not as extreme as looked possible yesterday. Although things could swing back in the other direction, because it is really dependent. Uh, on exactly where that surface low blows up. So I want to show uh, what the winds are going to look like here. Uh, and these are, uh, again, this is from the American model. 
uh, uh, the American model, these are 850 millibar winds. So these are not winds at the surface. These are winds about 5,000 feet up in the atmosphere to give a better sense since the topography doesn't. So you can kind of see this storm blows up in situ. It's not, there's not much of anything there. And then it really gets cranking uh, by Sunday morning. And by Sunday morning, you can actually see these are very strong 850 millibar winds uh, essentially, uh, these, uh, at 850 millibar, these are winds that are that are sort of up there in locally uh, up above 80 knots, and so that's like 85 miles an hour at 5,000 feet elevation. And these are sustained winds, so you know uh, these these are these are quite strong. And because this is a dynamic and strengthening storm system, and there's also going to be some atmospheric instability with some convective elements and thunderstorms, it is possible that some of these stronger wind gusts in excess of 70 miles an hour would mix down to the surface. Uh, that would be particularly true uh, really from about western Santa Barbara County northward, uh, as I mentioned, along uh, the San Luis Obispo, uh, Big Sur, Monterey County Coast, Santa Cruz County, San Mateo County, and maybe up into the Central Bay Area, depending on exactly where the surface low goes. You can see here that there's a pretty big difference even between San Francisco and the North Bay here, where North Bay doesn't get quite as extreme winds uh, but here, uh, the Central Valley, particularly, and the foothills, the Central Sacramento Valley, uh, really kind of gets raked with these winds. So again, these are winds that are up there about 5,000 feet in the atmosphere, 850 millibar winds. Looking closer to the surface, this you know, uh, the, the, this this shows uh, over water. You know, there there could still be sustained winds of 50 to 55 miles an hour over the water, and this model doesn't do a good job representing the, the winds over land, so I would kind of ignore them. But just to pay, just to pay attention to what's out there over the water, you know, these are 50, 55 knot sustained winds over the open ocean, uh, potentially. And so that translates to potential for a major wind event along the central coast in particular, with a little bit of uncertainty about whether that might extend northward into the Bay Area and across the Central Valley. So I don't think this is going to be a major windstorm along the north coast. I don't think this is going to be a major windstorm uh, from LA County eastward, but in between, it certainly could be uh, a significant event. And again, this is just one run of one model. Here is the most recent European model uh, wind prediction showing uh, a, 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 a slightly different picture. So this would be a less extreme wind event, uh, certainly, because the low does not deepen as much, and it, and it comes in a little bit further to the south. So this would this would mean that the, the Bay Area would mostly be out of the major winds. This would really be a central coast event, and the winds would be weaker. But the important thing also is this means that there would be a longer duration of uh, heavy precipitation and, uh, across the transverse ranges of Southern California. So look how long uh, that lingers. Uh, and this is, let me go back one more. Uh, this is an even older run, suggesting that you know this could linger a long time across Southern California and backbuild. So there could be backbuilding of precipitation. Uh, again, the European model is significantly wetter for coastal Southern California. This is still showing very heavy rainfall totals, although again less extreme potentially uh, than yesterday. So uh, you know there is a little bit of good news in here. We still don't know exactly. Uh, where uh, I'm going to bring my, my, my own camera back up here. Uh, there still is some uncertainty regarding uh, exactly uh, where how this low pressure system is going to evolve. That's one of the reasons why I'm planning on having another live session Sunday morning uh, where the storm should just be ramping up. We'll have a much better idea of exactly what's going to happen. But uh, I, I still think it's important for folks in flood prone areas in Southern California, uh, particularly from LA County into Santa Barbara or San Luis Obispo County to prepare for what could potentially still be a quite significant and life threatening flood event. It does not look like it may be quite as extreme uh, as some of the ensemble members had predicted, uh, projected yesterday. And part of the reason for that is it looks like the phasing, the temporal uh, and spatial uh, positioning of the storm relative to this extremely moist plume of tropical and subtropical moisture might not be quite right to produce the longest duration, highest intensity precipitation event as might have been possible. So that is, I think, generally good news, although I still think that there is at least an outside chance that that solution comes back on the table and we could be back to what we were looking at yesterday. And then even what we are looking at right now, the most likely outcome, it's still super wet. This would still push almost all of Southern California to above average precipitation for the entire season. 
probably validating those tilt on the odds towards wet or winter uh, predictions from earlier in the year, by the way. This is a very classically uh, El Nino-like pattern for Southern California, and I think uh, much of Southern California will reap both the benefits and some of the harms that come from that. Uh, now, the question of whether there's a really big wind event along the central coast into the Bay Area or Central Valley, that remains at this point unresolved, and there is still some tension really between uh, a stronger wind event to the north and a more extreme rain event uh, to the south. Uh, if, if we really lose some of the wind event in the north, then that does increase, once again, the likelihood of a really heavy prolonged rain event in the south. If we gain some of the stronger winds on the north end, that probably shifts uh, the balance of risk more towards a wind event up north. Um, one thing I do also want to point out, and there, the, you know, it, I'm not talking about the San Francisco Bay Area in terms of flood risk as much with this system, but there's still some uncertainty there. And if we get that surface low to spin up closer to the Bay Area, as the GFS is indicating versus the, the European model, and if there's a significant amount of convective instability, as is suggested again by both of the models, then there could actually be some significant risk of flash flooding, mudslides, particularly in cases in places like the Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, Big Sur Coast looks like it's going to get hit hard no matter what. That is one region where there's gonna be a lot of rain almost irrespective of which outcome. Probably uh, the peaks there are going to see seven to 10 inches of rain in a day or two or more. Things are already saturated. Uh, they just fixed Highway 1 again uh, after it fell into the ocean again, and we will see if that fix holds among other challenges that we tend to get with really heavy rainfall events around, along the Big Sur coast. Uh, this will be a big storm for Big Sur and the central coast probably either way. It is on the uh, 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 on the margins to the north and south where we don't know quite whether this will be um, a, more, a more severe wind event for the Bay Area or a more severe rain and flood event for uh, more southerly parts of, of Southern California. So both of those options remain on the table. Uh, this is still going to be a really big storm, certainly the biggest and most intense storm of the year so far, and we've seen some decent ones. Uh, this will probably be the biggest snow event to low to medium elevations in the Sierra Nevada so far this year. So that's, you know, it's going to be a travel nightmare, but it is good news probably from a snowpack perspective. And there is the potential still for us a notably damaging windstorm along portions of the central coast, maybe extending up into southern parts of the Bay Area and parts of the Central Valley too and the potential for a potentially very significant rain uh, and long duration rain and potential flood event in Southern California where there is still uncertainty regarding just how extreme the rain and flooding will be. The models have backed off slightly relative to yesterday and the more extreme rainfall outcomes for coastal Southern California, which is good. One reason why there is always cautious and careful messaging from uh, meteorologists and the National Weather Service and why it's not always a good idea to highlight the most extreme potential outcomes. That said, this still has some quite high-end potential, and in particular, if there are any additional embedded, uh, very intense uh, thunderstorm or convective elements, as we have seen with almost every system this winter, as I mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, localized risk of severe flash flooding under those conditions would be quite high. Uh, so if we do get those intensive bands of, of high hourly rain rate thunderstorms anywhere from the Bay Area south to San Diego at some point during this event, then watch out. There will likely be significant flooding where that happens, not just minor nuisance roadway flooding, but genuinely uh, uh, life-threatening and potentially destructive flooding if, if and where that occurs. So again, still uncertainty in this. I'm going to have another live session Sunday morning, 10 a.m. to talk about this where it will be clearer. I am waiting to see what happens with the model runs today to see whether or not I'm going to update with a, a Weather West blog post. Right now, the post from earlier this week still stands uh, pretty solid, um, honestly, uh, for a five, five or six days in advance um, because there's still uncertainty as to exactly how storm number two is going to evolve. If it ends up evolving towards an extreme windstorm in the north or a more extreme rain event in the south, both of which are still realistic possibilities, I may end up just doing a quick uh, blog update uh, sort of off cycle to really uh, emphasize the risks as they become clearer. But right now, you can also follow uh, me on social media and then here on YouTube uh, for further updates. So now uh, I wanna actually look at the comments uh, go through. I did answer those initial comment uh, comments from CBS, hopefully, 
Uh, but I'm going to take another sip of water. You may briefly see another ad while I sip the water, and then I'm going to start answering questions live. So stay tuned. Uh, no more than 20 to 30 seconds for that. Yeah, Mary mentions uh, that uh, there was uh, lightning in Alameda County yesterday. There was lightning in quite a few places yesterday, including in San Francisco and in highly populated parts of coastal Southern California. So a lot of people saw it. There was also uh, an as yet formally unconfirmed tornado in Sonoma County uh, near Petaluma yesterday. It was probably a, a weak uh, EF0 type. There's actually a pretty cool video of it. It had a full condensation funnel. It looked like going all the way to the ground. Um, I don't think the weather service has formally confirmed it. It may be difficult to confirm if it didn't cause damage because tornadoes are a classic question of if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to see it, uh, did it occur? Well, of course it occurred, but can we verify that it did if there's no real damage is another question. But from the video, I know it's not officially a tornado until the weather service says it is, but it was probably a weak EF0 kind of tornado because it's pretty clear that there was a condensation funnel extending all the way to the ground. So whoever, uh, kudos to whoever took that footage, it is pretty cool. I don't think it caused significant damage or we would have had a easier confirmation of that tornado. Could be events like that, uh, again, with various points in California, in the Central Valley, or in the Bay Area, uh, or in coastal Southern California with this storm sequence Sunday through Tuesday. I would not be surprised to see another event or two like that or some uh, severe thunderstorm winds and torrential downpours. So the main risk from convective thunderstorm events over this coming event will probably be um, severe, strong, uh, strong wind gusts in excess of 60, 70 miles an hour locally, and the torrential rainfall that could lead to flash flooding. But you never know, there is always the potential for brief tornadic spin outs This is more likely with the isolated cells uh, spinning around the low pressure system after the main storm than actually with the main storm itself. And that was true uh, as happened yesterday. This is just an isolated thunder cell up in the North Bay that did appear to drop a tornado, a weak one near Petaluma. All right, let's see. Um, question from David. Uh, do you think this is the biggest set of storms for the winter, or could we get an even bigger set of storms into March? Uh, it's probably the, the most significant set of storms so far, I think that's fair to say, but it is relatively early. People forget that it is just barely February, and during a strong El Nino year, we would expect the season to peak probably February and March, so there are at least six, seven more weeks of potential. I would not be surprised if there was another quite major storm cycle at some point in that window. Difficult to pinpoint right now. Uh, before the El Nino sort of forcing probably goes away pretty quickly. So there are signs that El Nino is about to wrap or weaken rapidly, but it hasn't done so yet. And so it is still exerting an El Nino-like influence on the global atmosphere. So we got at least a few more weeks of that influence continuing and probably maybe through February or March. Thereafter, it's probably going to fall apart pretty fast. We're going to transition back towards La Nina. But even just with this coming storm sequence, central and southern California, a lot of it is probably going to have above average seasonal precipitation totals already. Uh, and then there might be uh, another storm cycle, a significant storm cycle to follow. So that would be, uh, you know, that would be either uh, great, uh, icing on the cake, uh, depending on the situation, or could cause prop further problems if it happens within a couple weeks of this current storm cycle because everything is going to be very wet and saturated and rivers running high for the next few weeks after uh, really anywhere uh, from central and southern California southward. So, um, you know, another major storm cycle after that would cause even bigger problems. We'll just have to see what happens with that. But I would not be too surprised if there was another major storm cycle to come after this. It is still relatively early um, and we do tend to see strongly back-weighted winters in years like this one. So you know, winters where there's much more active conditions January through March than there was uh, in autumn and in De in De into December. All right. Uh, yeah, Big Sur Kate mentions that the Weather Service is predicting uh, five to seven inches in Big Sur. That sounds entirely reasonable. In fact, up on the peaks above Big Sur, I would not be surprised 
to see those totals end up on those isolated, very wet, orographically favored peaks in the 10 to 15 inch range. So again, we're going to see some landsliding, some mudslides, hopefully Highway 1 makes it through okay. But that's a lot of water falling pretty quickly, given that we just saw a lot of water go through there recently. So this could be yet another problematic storm for the Big Sur coast in particular. And that also looks like the region that's most likely to see very strong winds at this point. Again, as I mentioned, it could extend further south or north of that, but that is probably going to get hit pretty hard with the winds also, that region of coast regardless. Let's see. Uh, the question from Peter, what are the chances of the atmospheric river shifting east to focus over Orange County, uh, San Diego, Western Riverside, San, San, I'm assuming San, San Bernardino County? That depends. There is a chance that this system uh, could um, stall out somewhere. And this is really, this is the extreme flood risk scenario for Southern California is that if this atmospheric river, if, if the phasing of the low pressure system and any frontal waves is such that this, that this band of very heavy precipitation stalls out for 24 to 48 hours uh, somewhere, that is where the really severe flood risk will be. And we don't have a good sense of where that would be yet. I think it would be most likely to happen in Santa Barbara, Ventura counties again, as has happened already this year. But there is at least a chance it could be more for, farther to the east over LA, Orange, San Bernardino, or even San Diego. And I think that San Diego and OC actually have higher uh, likelihood of seeing a prolonged period of heavy rain even later. So not Sunday into Monday, but maybe Monday to, into Tuesday uh, as the secondary band of tropical moisture might stall out a little bit farther south and east. So don't be too surprised if San Diego stays dry for the first half of the storm, but then gets hit pretty hard once things start to dry out farther to the west. And then that heavy rain lingers later uh, potentially across that region. And again, there are still people who are digging out from the pretty serious flooding in San Diego from that very intense thunderstorm downpour just last week. So that is something uh, to, to consider. All right. Um, How does uh, Jack asks, uh, how does this compare to last year's January 10th storm? You know, it really depends. Uh, no two storms are comparable. The antecedent conditions were really wet, even wetter last year. Um, this may produce some impacts in some places that are similar or even a little worse than that, than that storm last year, but it's not the same storm. It's not going to hit the same stretch of coast. So some people are going to get hit worse. Some people will be hit much less intensely than that storm. The real risk of this storm that really stood out is the potential for that subtropical rain band to stall somewhere in Southern California for one to three days. Obviously, if it stalls for three days, it's a much more serious situation than if it stalls for one. If it doesn't stall at all, if it just sort of brings an equal opportunity, heavy but not extreme rainfall event to all of Southern California, that's probably the best case scenario. Everyone gets really wet and no one gets all of it all at once. Really, the problem is going to be if all that precipitation concentrates into essentially one place and trains across a consistent axis for many hours. We don't know if that's going to happen yet. It is still possible. If it does, that is where the really high end flood risk comes from. It looks slightly less likely than it did yesterday, uh, but you know, it's still something to, to, to consider. Greg says, uh, back weighted equals miracle march. I mean, the thing is, we don't really need a miracle this year. At this point, more than half of California has above average precipitation for the season to date, and that's really going to accelerate after this storm cycle ends. Now, one exception, glaring exception, is the Sierra Nevada, which has not fared as well, either in terms of total precipitation uh, or in term, especially in terms of snowfall, and that is a combination of actual low precipitation and warmer temperatures. So, uh, the percent of average for precipitation is better than the percent of average for snow because some of that snow has fallen as, or sorry, some of that precipitation has fallen as rain rather than snow. And also a lot of it has melted in between. But I think this storm is really going to help out, uh, especially central and southern Sierra with some significant lower elevation snow accumulation. So I still think SWE will be lower than average, but it'll be a lot closer to average. And really all the coastal areas from the Bay, from the Bay Area southward are going to be sitting pretty 
uh, after this event in terms of seasonal totals. So I don't think we really, I mean, we went into this year with really wet conditions, good reservoir conditions, good uh, minimal to no drought conditions, and this already looks like it's a pretty good water year in Central and Southern California. Um, the snow snowpack will improve somewhat, although probably still be below average after this event. It's not, it's, I wouldn't really say it's a year where we need a miracle march in the same way that we would have after a very dry year. This just hasn't been that. Uh, but could March be really active and we get a lot of storm activity on the back end? Yes, that's possible. And we may be asking for it to, to end uh, sooner uh, sooner than, than later in March if that happens, because already after the storm cycle, we're going to be well above average precipitation in some spots for the whole season. So interesting context there. And, you know, we went into this year with relatively damp conditions. To, so, so we're not trying to dig out of a deep drought right now in California. Let's see. Yeah, there is a lot of concern. I think you know, as unfortunately as there always is these days, you know, Big Sur coast uh, has major um, susceptibility both to really extreme precipitation events because of the topography. There's some pretty tall mountains that rise almost straight out of the ocean and intercept massive amounts of water during these kinds of events. And also, there is coastal infrastructure that is highly vulnerable. Highway One is essentially running along these coastal cliffs. And those coastal cliffs, geologically, likes to, like to slew off into the ocean. So it's kind of Caltrans is fighting a perpetual battle with basic geology. Uh, you know, and it's remarkable sometimes to some of us that that road uh, ever lasts more than a year. You know, despite all these massive en engineering interventions. I mean, that, that is a section of coast where the landmass really just wants to crumble into the Pacific and you built a, a, a highway along that. And then some folks say, well, why, why do we even have a highway there? And well, people do live there and it's actually it would be even more difficult to give access to folks uh, by building, you know, individual highways down a lot of these canyons from the east. That, that might be an even greater challenge. So this is going to be actually a pretty big conundrum, I think, in a warming climate with more extreme atmospheric rivers and more coastal erosion, larger pounding waves along the coast from below, and more potential for flooding and erosion from top down, uh, you know, land, land, uh, land slope failures from above and beneath. Uh, that's going to be a really tough uh, section of coastline to keep maintaining from a transportation infrastructure perspective in a warming climate. So I don't know necessarily, you know, I don't have any good solutions to it, except to say that this is going to be an increasingly big challenge moving forward. But I don't think it makes, you know, just like all, any, any other place, I think it's, it's, it's tough to abandon it because people live there. And that is, in some cases, and in many cases, really the sole access point, you know, off of Highway 1 uh, along that section of coast. So that's going to be an interesting thing to watch moving forward to think about how we might address that. Uh, question, would it be safest to stay off the roads, particularly between uh, San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara on Sunday, or probably okay before Sunday later afternoon? I think most parts of the state will be okay Sunday morning in terms of travel. Uh, definitely better Sunday morning than Sunday later. Um, this storm might take some time getting into Southern California and the Central Coast, so I think that you know before noon Sunday is probably okay for the most part. I don't really like to, get, to give really specific predictions because that can change, but it's definitely going to be worse later in the day and then into Monday than it is early on Sunday. That's for sure. A few folks asking if I have a Patreon uh, available. Yes, although uh, you don't really get anything uh, other than the satisfaction of supporting Weather West from it. So, you know, you're equally... Uh, uh, welcome to contribute to the Weather West channel just via the, uh, the actually I included a link to the to uh, buy me coffee uh, link right at the beginning of the chat so you can just click that directly and I know some folks have contributed directly through YouTube in the chat thank you for that I'm not honestly even totally sure how to do that um, I'm, I'm, I'm a late adopter 
of technology. So the fact that I'm streaming live on YouTube on a regular basis is still um, is still a, a big step up uh, for me. So despite you know despite all that visibility, uh, uh, I'm I'm late to the party usually. Uh, but you know I try and do a uh, a, a reasonable job with the technology and I am pleased to say that thanks to some of those crowdsourced contributions earlier this year which were enough to get a, a much better uh, hardware for doing these live stream events and um, I did eventually figure out uh, it's it's not the most glamorous solution but there is a, a an ethernet cable that I just string through the hall uh, coming to this room when I do the live streams, that does seem to help out uh, quite a bit with the stability of these streams. So all of this is thanks to the crowdfunded uh, contributions. And so um, it doesn't solve the broader problem of supporting public-facing weather and climate scientists in the world. That's an institutional crisis uh, and uh, really, I think, is going to require buy-in from philanthropic institutions, uh, so foundations and, and, and the like. If you have connections, let me know. But otherwise, at the margins, it's still really helpful. So I do really appreciate that because it does specifically help facilitate the quality of uh, these live sessions and the maintaining all of the equipment and the considerable software subscriptions that it requires to do this as a one-man team. I don't have any background in audio-visual stuff, IT stuff. I am a, a physical scientist and that doesn't necessarily mean I'm good at all those other things. And so uh, it is helpful to be able to um, capitalize on the support and the knowledge of the broader community when these things do pop up. So I do think finally we've gotten most of the way there uh, on the technological front. So that is good news. Um, all right, I'm gonna keep going through the questions, see what else uh, is here. Uh, let's see here. And just as always, I know that there's a lot of folks asking some other kinds of questions. Um, I'm, ne I'm never able to answer all of them in this, uh, in this live, uh, live session format. I try and keep it to the ones that are on topic to the day's conversation. I will occasionally have a sort of ask me anything style sessions that are probably a better place for some of these questions. Uh, just because I, I can't continuously be on here forever. I do have to cut it off at some point, but, uh, you know, I the enthusiasm is always good to see. Uh, let's see what else we've got here. Um, whoops! You just heard my pen fall. Sorry about that. A question, are we still trending back towards La Nina for next winter? Normally it would be impossible to say anything about that this early, you know, a year out, but unusually right now there are very strong signals that the answer is going to be yes. So we'll have a whole conversation about that later, but it looks like it would be a La Nina that we've, uh, unlike we've seen before in the sense that the extratropical oceans will remain record warm even as the equatorial Pacific cools off due to La Nina. So again, another configuration of ocean surface temperatures and interbasin tropical ocean coupling that we've never seen before. And so that could be another interesting conversation in six to eight months, but let's have that later when, uh, when, when the, the current activity has passed. All right, let's see. Um, John asks if there are any good resources for forecasting flooding. I, I'm assuming it's sort of in real time and maps of those forecasts, or is it really just qualitative impression based on rainfall? My answer is going to be a little bit nuanced. There are within the National Weather Service like specific forecast points um, like on, on, on gauged USGS gauged streams. So essentially there are models internally within the weather service and the river forecast centers with the NOAA that will generate, uh, flood predictions for specific points on streams that have USGS gauges, uh, and a long enough historical record to essentially correlate temperature and precipitation to stream flow. But these are pretty limited models. Uh, they don't, suggest 
they don't predict overland inundation. So if the answer is, can you just get like a map of places that are expected to flood given the weather forecast? The answer is essentially no. We still don't have that. It is a little bit shocking that we don't operationally. California is trying to put something like this into place. I've been involved with this as part of ArcStorm. The Department of Water Resources is trying, but honestly, there has just been so little interest from a higher, higher levels uh, in the state, so little funding devoted to this that the answer is we still don't have that capacity. Um, so shockingly, the United States does not really have a go-to you know, modeling system at this time that's fully operational where if you just plug in pr predicted rainfall and snow melt and temperatures and things like that, you can't just then get out a map of places that are expected to flood. We do not have that uh, in the real real time ability. There are models available to do that, but it is you know it's a major undertaking. So right now we're stuck with point forecasts on individual rivers, and you know if you got a creek in your backyard or it runs under the street in your neighborhood, there's a good chance that there's no official prediction at all for that because it's too small to have a USGS gauge and to have uh, an official forecast point from the River Forecast Center. So. It is, uh, it, it is, it is frustrating, uh, and and we and in California at least you know there, there isn't a systematic way of doing this. So it is, I wouldn't call it qualitative, but but there is a qualitative element to it. And beyond those specific river forecast points, stream flow forecast points, it, it you know it's it's tough. There there isn't always a clear path, and I wish we had that, and I hope we will in the future, but. Again, it's really a question of where we're investing our money, and there just hasn't really been interest or momentum toward that in California. I don't really understand it, but historically that has been the case. Have I uh, have I seen the the ground uh, a groundhog yet today? I, I've not personally seen one, and I actually haven't paid attention to uh, whether Punxsutawney Phil saw his shadow or not because it. Um, Except for uh, as a as a boost is a booster to the tourism industry in in Pennsylvania, it doesn't really matter. Uh, Punxsutawney Phil is wrong exactly as much as you'd expect if you were uh, guessing by random chance. Same thing is true of the Farmer's Almanac, by the way. So I don't necessarily fault uh, the 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 Pennsylvania tourism officials for for amping up the the rodent-based uh, seasonal predictions because, it, you know, why not at that point if people are, are, are looking at the farmer, Farmer's Almanac? It's about as plausible uh, a predictor as, as that would be. So you might, you might as well get some tourist dollars, I guess. Sell those morning breakfast pastries uh, and those bed and breakfast uh, and the rooms. Uh, but uh, uh, does look like, uh, regardless of what uh, a particular... Um, a highly publicized rodent in Pennsylvania saw this morning, it does look like there is going to be still uh, quite a bit of winter yet to come in California just because of that likelihood of a back-weighted season this year into February and March. We're certainly seeing it now, and there's no obvious indication it's just going to fizzle out in the next, you know, four to six weeks. You never know, but on average, I'd expect things to stay pretty active at least through March, and probably get at least one more significant storm cycle during that period. Uh, wave impacts with this storm? Uh, the short answer is yes, and I hesitate to be more specific because exactly what kind of waves and where will depend on the storm trajectory. I will say this storm is actually too close to the coast and too recently developing to bring those really long period high energy waves that cause those tsunami-like inundations in Ventura. You actually get those sorts of wind waves more often from storms that are quite distant from California. So sometimes the storms that are higher impact from a rain and wind perspective don't always bring the biggest waves. It's not always true. There still could be big waves though. Uh, due to the strong winds and low pressure and there could be some local problems because I know there is a uh, a king tide cycle coming up again around February 9th. So the storm won't quite align with that, but you know, it'll be within a couple of days of that. So uh, I'm not quite sure how much of the, the king tide surge occurs in the two days leading up to it, but you know, uh, there could be some issues. I don't think they'll be as big though, because the waves themselves won't be as long period or quite as energetic. So big breakers, but not necessarily as much energy associated with the long period. 
So, but I'm not an oceanographer, so uh, I would defer to others on that front. Do I see any considerable risk for wind in Santa Barbara and Ventura County Sunday into Monday? Maybe in western half of Santa Barbara County, maybe including the city of Santa Barbara. So it's a little unclear. It depends where that surface low goes. The western half of Santa Barbara County is in at least that southern margin of where the winds could be pretty significant, but might not be. I think Ventura County, it's probably going to be breezy to windy, but nothing dramatic. There in Ventura County, the risk is squarely a very heavy rain and potential significant flooding, I would say. Uh, to wit, uh, Neil mentions that the current Ventura River forecast from the, the River Forecast Center uh, does show it briefly exceeding flood stage on Sunday night. That forecast is very much conditioned on the median rain prediction. So if we end up wetter than the median, then that could be a significant flood. If it ends up not being as persistent, it probably won't flood at all. So there is a risk of flooding even on the larger rivers in Southern California, but the bigger concern is flash flooding and debris flows. So there is a little bit of discussion about how some of the debris flow diversion systems uh, in near Santa Barbara and in Montecito uh, downstream of the Thomas fire have been removed finally this year. Uh, there is a chance that the system will test that. Uh, now keep in mind that the Montecito debris flow is a pretty unique confluence of an extraordinarily heavy but very localized 15 minute downburst, cloudburst, brought about an inch of rain in some spots in 15 minutes, just an incredible amount of water. And the Thomas fire had just occurred. It was only about a month later. So the conditions are not the same. Uh, and I think that the warning systems in Santa Barbara County are much better than they were back in 2018 when that disaster occurred. But this is also does have the potential to be a pretty extreme event and could even produce very high one hourly rainfall rates potentially. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not by any means predicting a repeat of what happened in Montecito in 2018. But on the other hand, this is the kind of system that gives us pause because it does at least have a slight potential to produce similar rainfall conditions, even though the antecedent wildfire conditions are not the same, nor is the level of preparedness, both of which are would, would tend toward a much decreased likelihood or severity of these kinds of events. Let's see, uh, I'm past the hour, so I'm gonna wrap it up the last few questions here. Um, All right, looks like uh, that's most of the questions. Uh, some folks are, are attenuating in the live session, so I think I'm gonna call it. Uh, I've been speaking for 70 minutes. Probably time for me to take a break. Uh, I will definitely have at least one more live session in this sequence, Sunday morning, 10 a.m. If things get really interesting, I will probably do another live session at some other point, most likely later on Sunday or Monday if that happens. And depending on the evolution of the systems, I may or may not have a new Weather West blog post. I'm more likely to have one if one of the two scenarios ends up trending more extreme, either a severe wind event near the Bay Area, Central Coast, or and or a more extreme upper end rain and flood event in Southern California, both of which options appear on the table. Again, uh, I'm a little, I'm slightly less concerned with a really high-end flood event in Southern California than I was yesterday, which I think is generally good news, but I, we still can't completely rule it out, and even the most likely scenario still brings a high likelihood of widespread urban and small stream flooding and locally severe flash flooding, severe and life-threatening flash flooding in Southern California. The question is whether that severe type of flash flooding is widespread or more isolated. So this is still going to be a major storm event for much of Southern California and the Central Coast. High wind potential along the Central Coast and maybe up into the Bay Area and parts of the Central Valley. Extreme rain risk, especially in Santa Barbara and Ventura counties, but maybe extending north uh, to the Big Sur Coast or eastward uh, all the way into San Diego, Orange counties, depending on how things go. It's all gonna depend on the phasing, the exact placement and intensity of the surface flow, and how long that subtropical atmospheric river stalls out somewhere across Southern California. Uh, so right now, still a waiting game. Um, 
sort of wait to see uh, kind of situation. Before I log off, I actually may look at one more thing since the latest European model uh, just came in. I'll see if it shows anything dramatically different um, than the last run. Uh, just taking a look uh, at the surface low where that's supposed to come in. Uh, and uh, let's see here. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's still relatively consistent uh, with what I was saying uh, earlier. Uh, everything, uh, just taking a look at that potential. Um, and then the total amount of water that falls out of that pattern. Uh, let's see. Uh, yes, so pretty much consistent, I think, uh, with what I was saying earlier in this conversation. Just looking at one last thing at the max winds, all of that still looks pretty consistent. So I think no dramatic changes now uh, with this most recent model update from the ECMWF. All right, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining again. See you all again Sunday morning. Uh, and uh, stay safe and dry out there. It does look like it's going to be quite a significant storm event uh, later Sunday uh, into Monday. So hold on to your hats and stay out of flood-prone areas.